Yeah, okay. Sorry. So um, we're, we're delighted to have uh, Brian uh, with us this evening and um, given us um, his, uh, his take on this whole idea of returning to collective training and potentially what is the most safest way for us as coaches to re-engage with the players that have been, I suppose, maybe in idle in relation to specifics of the game, but maybe uh, doing some sort of physical activity which maybe doesn't uh, resemble the game. So from that point of view, it would be really, really interesting to hear um, Brian giving us uh, really good advice, good sound advice in relation to how we should be approaching this return phase and how we can still make it enjoyable and engaging, but at the same time, very much a safe practice for, for all, all, all our players. So, uh, Brian, I'm just going to uh, hand you over to um, uh, your, your screen there now, if you want to be able to... Yeah, if I just, um, just um, share my screen. Yeah. Okay, okay, and uh, it's all yours, so thank you. Okay, can, can you see that okay, Jerry? Yeah? yeah, we can see that, yeah, perfect, yeah. Okay, just let me make sure I can navigate. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um. Okay. Yeah. Firstly, yeah. Thanks. For, thanks for having me on, Jer. Um. Uh. Really good. To, really good to see everyone. Um. Tonight's topic: so managing the return to training and competition. Um. The reason. The reason I picked it. I mean, obviously, um, everyone's in the same boat at the moment. A lot of players and coaches uh, lying idle. Uh, there's going to be a lot of collective giddiness in the next uh, couple of weeks in terms of returning to competition. And I just want to, uh, I, I just want to throw out some some suggestions or, or even ideas that will help you uh, design a safe return to, to competition for players and minimise the risk of, of silly injuries in the in, in the um, this, Although this is a unique time for all of us, we've never, you know, had to sit out training due to a pandemic before. But but it's it's not too dissimilar from coming off the back of, you know, our off season in the in the Christmas period and the pre season period. The fundamental principles um, remain the same. Drawing on my experiences um, a lot in, in in that regard. So I mean, as, as I've said before, we're in uncharted territory in terms of. Um, a shutdown or a lockdown, and uh, the only similarities I could I could think of were the the NFL lockdown in in 2011 over over player contracts. Um, what happened then there was ultimately an an accelerated uh, an accelerated or shortened uh, preseason. Um, a really condensed preseason block before they went into their, their regular season, and, and, and what the, what happened was a spate in a spate of injuries or rapid increase in injuries. So this is just uh, Achilles tendon ruptures. So I think um, the average of between 1997 and 2002, I think the average of, of there was an average of two, um, and I went up to to 12 for the same period after uh, after the lockdown. So. Um, you know, we're going into something similar. I'm, I'm sure these players have been training and playing uh, or training co collectively during this lockdown. I've no doubt about it. But it's, it's very hard to replicate uh, the, the demands of, of, of match play and going straight into you know high intensity activity early on without an adequate base uh, could potentially leave, leave leave players at increased risk of injury. If you look a little bit closer to home and, and a little bit more recently, obviously the Bundesliga has returned one of the first major uh, sporting uh, say organizations or, or leagues to return in, in recent weeks. Um, and some interesting stuff coming out of, of the Bundesliga there. So a lot of back up and running, they are seeing a, 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 a small spike in injuries post lockdown. Now, I, I would put an asterisk on this. In fact, that there's been a very small number of games played to date and it's a very, a very small sample size, but there is an increasing trend towards you know, more, more injuries uh, than usual. And again, it, it boils back to the, to the point of first May, May the players are going into, into high-octane you know, competition, potentially without a, uh, an, an adequate base. Um, I can't say what, what these teams have done beforehand before they started, but uh, and injuries are multifactorial. I should have probably said that at, at, at the start. Um, you, you cannot attribute all, all, all injuries pure, pure, purely to, to training, but you know, nonsensical, um, nonsensical training can be a contributing factor. So where we've been for the last number of weeks, obviously our, our pitches have been closed, much to the to the frustrations of many. Um, our routines have been taken away from us. Our, our training schedules, which has been norm for players up and down the country, have, have been taken away. 
Does that mean players have done have done nothing over the last number of weeks? I highly doubt it. Um, and as you've seen, this has been publicised in, in in pro athletes around the world. Um, you know, athletes are finding ways to to train and keep fit, which is which is really really positive. Um, but I think you'll all agree, you know, training in training in a park in Tampa or, or throwing a ball on a beach is not going to replicate the, the demands of the NFL. Um, you know, players will need a preparatory period to, to, to build themselves back up or address any areas of, of deconditioning that may have uh, arose during this period. So what's, what, what's most likely to have happened, in, in my opinion? Um, obviously, the, the gyms have been closed, uh, GA facilities are closed. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for players, I would say, certainly I've experienced with, with my own players, is um, an inability to, to, to continue their, their, their strength training. Now, coaches have made a, a best effort to, to replicate that with you know, body weight exercises, on-field on field ac- activities. But you know, it, it, it isn't like for like. You can't replicate, you know, getting under the bar in terms of developing strength, getting under the bar and, and, and shifting, shifting heavy loads. Um, and the reason that's, that's important, obviously, from a performance point of view, if we want to, if we want to be strong, if we want to be powerful, the amount of force we can produce is, is, is really important. And, and, and that, that's why we strength train. Um, but from an injury prevention point of view as well, some, some research has come out of uh, Talai in the last number of years has shown that the stronger uh, Gaelic footballers are relative to their body mass, the less likely they are to sustain uh, lower limb soft tissue injuries. So if you look at this, this graph I have here, so three, 3.0 on the extreme right-hand side, so that's someone who can shift uh, three times their body weight um, in a hex bar exercise. So if, if they weigh 80 kilos, they can, they can for one RM shift 240 kilos uh, in a hex bar. And that, that is obviously beneficial in terms of, 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 of uh, strength and power development, but it's also hugely uh, beneficial in terms of re- reducing their, their risk of, uh, of lower limb injuries. Does that mean that athlete is completely protected from getting a lower limb injury? Absolutely not. But you are, by being stronger, you're just mitigating the risk increasing the likelihood of, of, of staying available. The same goes for uh, aerobic fitness. Uh, again, another study that has come out of uh, Tal IoT and, and Shane Malone, who actually works with uh, the Dublin senior footballers with myself. Um, guys pro, guys underperforming or performing poorly relative to their peers in, 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 uh, in tests of aerobic fitness in this particular study is a one, one kilometer time tra- trial are at increased risk of, of injury. Um, and, you know, a simple explanation for that could be that you know, a guy coming back to training with poor fitness levels, a given training session will probably take more out of him than, than a player with a higher level of fitness. So as a result, by the time the next training session comes around, that player is probably not fully recovered. So he's going into the next training session still carrying a little bit of fatigue from, from the previous session. And, 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 and that, that gets into a cycle. Um, and once it's, once it's carried out over an extended period of time, eventually you know, the player is at a much higher risk of, 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 of injury. So understanding you know, which players are maybe have deconditioned over the last number of months and, and which players may have not is really, really, really important. So how do we, as 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 coaches, mitigate? These are really the kind of uh, kind of couple, kind of five kind of take home points for for coaches that you know practical things you guys can do to mitigate the risk. I didn't want to just throw study after study at you guys. So I want to make it as as practical as possible. Um, and again, when I said at the start, a lot of these principles, you know, I have followed in, from from day one in coaching. Um, you know, and coming off the back of of a long layoff, you know. You know that that doesn't change, I and mean, these are still really sound principles that you know we should obviously try and put in place with it, with with immediate immediate effect upon return, but also as you as you continue to to train teams over the coming over the coming seasons. So avoiding so, sudden increases in training frequency and, and intensity. Um, we know that rapid spikes in 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 volume and intensity can put players at at increased uh, risk of injury. You may have heard the terms of acute and chronic uh, workload. So acute workload would be representative of uh, perhaps a single week, whereas chronic workload would be 
or an extended uh, period of time, often, often three to four weeks. So if we get a spike in, a, in acute uh, workload, so basically the amount of work or volume and intensity of training th this week has been much higher compared to the average of the previous three weeks, and we're putting that uh, group of players at, at, at risk of injury. Um, um, it's a, a term we used to use with, 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 with players um, was, was our battle rhythm and getting into a consistency of training that, um, they, that they become accustomed to and we, we try not to shock them with training and they get into the routine of you know when there's a heavy week, when there's a light week, you know what game week looks like and then their bodies get very used to it rather than this kind of boom bust style of training where they don't know what's coming from, from one week to the next. One week's very tough, one week's easy and just a a lack of planning can 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 leave 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 the players at at um, at, at increased risk. So the second one is acquiring baseline measures of, of physical capacity. Um, so understanding when your players come back to you, it's, it's I would really advise that you do some form of assessment on them, particularly in relation to their strength capabilities. If they have been doing a strength program before the lockdown, um, have a look at has there been any detraining. Um, and obviously their, their aerobic fitness as well, because as I've, as I've touched on, uh, decrease in both or, or poor levels of either component of fitness can, can put players at, at increased uh, risk of, fitness, of, of injury. Um, what I think will happen over the next few weeks is that everyone will go after the easy, easy win, which is fitness. Um, you know, I've often referred to the preseason in, in Gaelic football as a as, as silly season, and there's definitely a, a more is better approach. And it's 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 often an, an easy win for coaches. So everyone's going to tackle fitness. Everyone everyone's going to run. And in my opinion, I think a lot of coaches will will will, will neglect strength um, for whatever reason. It's it, it's often not recognised as an important component. Um, but my advice would be to start looking at it. Uh, start looking at it seriously. Um, if you want to improve your players and, and, and improve your team. Monitoring training load as well. So in the quote there, what, what gets measured gets managed. Um, I'm sure there's, there's a variety of coaches here with you know um, varying levels of backroom team support. Some could be one-man shows. Come, some could have five, ten. Senior at the county have, you know, could have a backroom team of, of, of 15 to kind of uh, support this whole area. Um, but what, what I mean by that, so I suppose workload, um, so just to define it, so like a combination of sports and non-sports, so like wellness questionnaires would be uh, really common, a profile of mood states, probably the most common one. So just getting an understanding of, of, of what's going on um, in people's lives, often outside of, of sports. So obviously we all work with amateur athletes. So with our own players, I like to know what's going on in their lives. Are they doing exams? Are they busy in work? You know, if they've young children, are they getting enough? Are they getting enough sleep? All can you know, all can uh, be hugely, uh, hugely detrimental to, to performance. Really, um, you know, particularly sleep, it can affect the recovery process. Um, monitoring their external load. You know, we, we use GPS. We, as I said, we, we try and keep our, our, our weeks relatively consistent. Um, obviously, we have periods of overload in there where we stress players more than we normally would. But we, again, we try and make sure that the jumps are, are, are not too too significant. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's certainly stuff out there that recommends that you know, your shift shouldn't be more than maybe 10% in a, in, in, in a given week. Do, do, we, do I strict, stick to that? stringently no um you know because often in, in in match play even in small set of games it can be it can it can be yeah, di difficult to control but um by and large we have an, we have an awareness of it uh, at least um we certainly try and steer the program uh, that direction internal load um and again so for for anyone that's working this on a, a club level or, or you know development squad level if you want to measure the intensity of 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 transition a simple rpe so rate of perceived exertion would, would be really advisable so scale of one to ten how difficult did you find that session so you know you, i'm sure you'll get varying varying response but you might have a target in your head i want this to be a difficult session so i'd like guys you know give me a seven and eight out of ten because guys are giving you a, a, a five or six you know that you've maybe under pitched that session it could have been it could have been a little bit harder. Equally, if you want to do um, maybe a skill-based session or a light session, if you want to ease players back into the training program, which I would recommend in the, in, in the early weeks of a program, you may be targeting RPs at the lower end of the scale. 
and equally if players are coming and giving you high OPs, maybe you know you're over pitching the session and you need to you need to you need to pull it back again. You also can flag individual differences as well, you know, um if there's any particular outliers like do, do players uh, differ significantly from the average might indicate that there's something going on with, with that particular player that you could that you, that you could address for them. Um, gradual exposure to, to, to high risk activities so for me the high risk activities in, in Gaelic football I mean the most obvious one is is sprinting uh, maximum running um, and obviously obviously contact training so, so how we integrate sprinting and, and contact back into the program is is really really important so do we on the first Tuesday night back do we do 15 20 100 meter sprints with guys or do we spend a couple of weeks maybe working on running mechanics, doing some tempo running, um, doing some 70, 80% efforts, allowing guys kind of to run freely and with a little, with a little bit more control? You know, equally on, on the contact side of things, do we do we throw them straight back into football? Do we just throw the football in on, on, on day one or do we spend a little bit of time working on on tackle technique, you know, uh, body position, footwork, um, things like that, just to kind of just to kind of jog, jog the memory a little bit because that's an area, you know, they, the will have obviously been neglected over the over the last uh, last number of weeks. I, I would expect a lot of players will come back, you know, fairly f- fairly running fit. They've been, you know, certainly from my own club here and, and chat to other other guys nearby. Everyone's been doing a lot of a lot of general running. Um, I wouldn't say anyone's been doing much sprinting. Um, so while it's 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 really important to be able to sprint, and it's it's important that you know. We sprint regularly in training. It's it's how we get there is really important, though. So you know, drawing a lot of high intensity running early, early in the in the early stages of a preparatory period can be can be can be quite risky. So uh, yes, we need to get to a point where you know three, four, five, six weeks into a program, players are sprinting and, and sprinting regularly. And um, you just need to manage how you how you get players to that. And, and same same uh, with contact. Well, affording players time to recover between sessions so um again in my in my experience there's a tendency or there's a there's a trail of thought out there that coaches have lost time um and there's potentially a little bit of giddiness to you know we need to get this done we need to get that done we need to get more into them and everyone's worried about what the neighbors up the road are doing and, and potentially falling behind um you know, and often to the detriment of, of, of the recovery process. Um, and if you think of if you think of the, the, the training continuum and, and the adaptations that take place to training, you know they don't they don't occur on the training field. They occur when the players are away from you, when they're, when you're resting at home in between sessions, when, when when you're sleeping at night. So if we if we take that away or impose on that with you know long sessions that you know go into two hours and you know they're late getting off the pitch late getting home we schedule sessions on, on consecutive days or we schedule you know double days uh, trying to catch up all you're doing is really you're, you're taking away that recovery process and, and you're, you're impacting uh, you're impacting on the on the adaptation and similar to to the player we discussed at the beginning that is you know probably a low level of fitness comes in there's a really tough session is carrying fatigue into the next session that's that, that's ultimately what happens players start to carry fatigue from 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 one session to the next um and in in, in the short term they may get they, they may get gains and improvements and in, 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 in fitness but over the long term it, it, it generally has an adverse effect in terms of just sustaining that 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 level of performance so this is um, this is it's just some recommended reading for 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 you guys. Um, so this guy, this guy Dan uh, Dan Clay, he runs the MSC program in in St Mary's Twickenham. Um, he's wrote this really straightforward. I would I would say it's not heavily scientific. Um, all about training and basic training principles that you, that you can apply to to any sport. Um, and I, I found I found it a really found it a really enjoyable read. Um, for one of the main reasons because it kind of supports a lot of my my ideas around training as well. Um, I feel it touches on a lot of the mistakes um, that we make in the GA. Um, and one of the concepts he discusses is, is, is the minimum effective training dose. So instead of always thinking what how much can I get into them? Can I get more sessions? Can I get more runs into them? He kind of flips that on his head. And says, well, what's the least uh, least amount uh, I can do with players to get the desired adaptation. So, 
for what I want to get out of this session, if I can get that in 30, 40 minutes, why would I spend, why would I spend 60 minutes on the, on the pitch? And the whole premise of that, um, so if we, if, if we increase the stress, so if we make sessions long, if we make them tougher, we obviously increase the time it takes to, to recover between training sessions. But um, I think if you can understand that there's not really a relationship between increasing at alarm pace and training adaptation. So a simple example of that would be, you know, obviously a two hour session is not 50% more effective than a, a one hour session, okay? So it's not always about putting more more in. Um, so again, we talk about that minimum level of stress uh, to get to desired adaptation. And what that does, if we start focusing on, on, on the quality of our training rather than the quantity of our training, um, it reduces the amount of time players need to recover between sessions so as such we can get more contact with our players and more 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 quality training with our players and something i always like to ask coaches when they're particularly during these busy periods um where you know again this would have been typically december january where, where players would have had a lot going on so when we're constantly trying to put more and more on them so are we actually making them better or, or are, are we making them tired um so that's 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 really all I wanted to kind of touch on today. And I, I wanted to make this. I wanted to give guys kind of obviously chances to to ask questions. I think we get a lot more out of uh, a little bit of back and forth in terms of your own experiences and maybe the only, you know, maybe the challenges you face or you think you're facing over the, over the next couple of weeks. So um, that's really all I have in terms of uh, in terms of the presentation. So I don't know, Jer, if you want to manage uh, with a Q and A or how we go about this, sir? Thanks, Brian. That was uh, uh, re really, really good. And um, I suppose the, the fact we, we've been uh, talking to one another over the last week or so, um, and I think I think the questions would be useful from from a coaching point of view because I'm sure guys have lots of questions. So thanks very much for that um, for that uh, really, really, really sound advice. And also those so, some some really good pieces of research there, and in particular the reference to the book that you gave us there, which I'm sure lots of guys would be interested maybe to get their hands on or have a look at it. So if anybody has a question, maybe the best way for me to manage that might be if you ha if you have a question, maybe raise your hand, and then I'll ask you to unmute yourself and, and take your um, put your your camera on, and you can ask Brian the question directly yourself. But maybe if I could get so maybe something started first. On that, uh, Brian, just in relation to the strength training you talked about, um, and obviously gyms are not going to be uh, accessible just at the moment, so any strength training that we do will obviously uh, involve being on the pitch. What would that look like to you in terms of, say, integrating it into your normal, say, you have an hour session of an hour with your footballers, and you want to obviously blend some of the football part as well. What would that look like to you on the field? Yeah, well, if I, like, I suppose you need to, again, until the gyms reopen, you do need to think a little bit outside the box still. Um, in terms of the big thing, like, I, I would be less concerned about, about upper body strength. Um, you know, a priority for me is always trying to get into players is, is, is hitting the lower limb strength, obviously, because your legs carry you in terms of transferring to performance, so sprinting, jumping. So I'd much rather a player that has good leg strength versus good upper body strength, if, 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 if that makes sense. Um, so you probably need to think about okay, how can I get these kind of you know heavy load, high force movements into training if if you obviously have you know restrictions in terms of access and gym. So when we think about leg strength, obviously I can use an example of you know a hex bar or, or any sort of uh, any sort of squat uh, variation. There's lots of things you can do outside on field. Like I don't know if anyone's familiar with like a heavy prowler or a heavy sled work as well. So that's a really good way to get some some unilateral or just single leg strength work in, in into players as well. Um, and again, you can load it up. You can have players standing on a sled and another player another player dragging them. Yeah. Um, you know things like you know if, if the if the if the if the tire is heavy enough, I think some retractor tires you can get are, are pretty pretty heavy to make. Yeah. They evoke a strength stimulus as well. Um, but if you're working on strength, you know you're probably you're, you do need to think. You know how can I get some load in from any kind of earing away outside of kind of repetition based training where it's light loads yeah. and, and lots of reps. Uh, it's not necessarily going to have the same same training effect. Okay. Super. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. For that. In terms of where you structure in your training, so if it would be, it would be at the start of the session. 
and right. there's no point doing kind of strength power based training um, at the end at the end when they're, when mm. they're under fatigue okay so if, if you do have access to that kind of equipment um, I certainly incorporate it early in the early in the training session uh, with any kind of plyometric activity like that um, obviously early in the training session too okay Great, thanks Brian for that. Um, I think Jim Lahan posted a, a question in there. So Jim, do you want to maybe ask that of Brian, please? Um, Brian, just wondering if you any advice on the, on the lads going back to their clubs and how we can get them to the maybe we don't have access to the guys first. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get, I didn't get all that, Jim. Sorry. Just you want to repeat that, Jim? Just we just yeah, missed a bit of it there. Uh, just advice to uh, the lads on as I go back to their clubs uh, to maybe give the, the club coaches some advice. Having this, I can imagine I'm going to go back for the next five weeks, like you said, GD coaches running them up hills and and whatnot. So how they can actually uh, manage their club coaches. Yeah, um, as well. I, I face that same same challenge, Jim. I mean, um, obviously, all all the players I work with are going to go back to their to their clubs, and and the level of of, of like, I I can't speak to the level of support they receive in terms of SNC or their training. If you know, there's a broad number of clubs, a broad number of of, of, of coaches involved. Um, I think if um, well, what, what what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to. I've, trying to implement some of the actions I've, I've kind of discussed there so um, ideally I'd love to get a testing window with, with our players give them some feedback on, on where they are that they can maybe bring back to the club so if, if, if a guy you know tests well in a running test I was to, you know let him know that you know he has tested well you know he's, he's maybe above average or, or in the range where he was this time last year it's maybe not an immediate priority for him I, I, I think we're as I said before, like a lot of the senior athletes, our senior players have been doing running conditioning, general running conditioning. I think their general running fitness will be okay. What they will lack is obviously that game-specific fitness. So um, no matter how much kind of volume running or 20-minute runs you do, when you go back into kind of game-specific stuff, you're, you're still going to find it difficult. Um, so you know, I, I would encourage coaches to go after maybe what they've, what they've missed out on. Um, obviously, the game-based uh, activities in, in, a, in a progressive manner and you know this non-contact phase we're probably going into as well is, is probably ideal ideal to do that um, you know, it's a really good window to work on, 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 on tactical setups and things like that kick out strategies and um, offensive setups uh, where players are spaced apart and working on patterns and, and, and phases of play um, so I'd, I'd encourage players maybe to, to bring some ideas back to their clubs um, and try and, and, and try and steer st steer their training a, a, a little bit from the from the experiences they've obviously got from the advice you're getting from you guys as well. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, thanks, Jim, for that. Um, Roger, I think you were looking to come in there, were you? Yeah, can you hear me, George? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you, Roger. Yeah. Brian, thanks very much for that. Very good and very very simple at the same time. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of clubs. Uh, we've got about a six-week window of opportunity. Probably we can't really revisit the aerobic base to any great extent. Um, you know, I've been on a few of these webinars recently where people are suggesting get the ball back in hand, get uh, movement, you know, the ability to slow up, to speed up, to slow down, to change direction, all of that stuff. And a wee bit around, you know, systems of play and strategies is as much as we can achieve in this six-week sort of window that we have. So I'm just wondering if you'd agree with that or is there anything else you'd add to that? Um, yeah, like, I, again, I, I generally agree. I, I don't think there's going to be a huge need to tackle aerobic fitness during this phase. I, I think players will be fine. And certainly, you know, um, guys that I've kind of kept in contact with and have been kind of sending me data over the, over the last few weeks of their kind of individual work, like, I, guys guys have maintained their fitness and, and are running well. Um I think there definitely is an opportunity to go after, you know, obviously the more game-based stuff you've, you've, you've touched on. The game-specific movements they've missed out on, the starting, the stopping, the change of direction, that can all be done in a very controlled manner early on and gradually progressed over, over, over six weeks. Um, a lot of kind of reactive-based things we can still do while maintaining social distancing, reacting to, reacting to partners, reacting to different, different movements. Um, 
one thing I maybe would just flag and maybe just be mindful of coaches, one thing that um, often gets neglected is maybe uh, the volume of, of, of kicking guys are doing. So I'd say that's, again, that's something that coaches probably should go after. You know, players haven't kicked one in a long time, but just having an awareness of the amount of you know, kicking guys are doing. You could have a situation, say a goalkeeper, for example, may not have, he may not have kicked the ball in weeks. He could go out and kick 150, 200 balls in a given week and and, and small things like groin issues, you know, pop up. So having an awareness of, of, of gradually progressing, everything is really important. Not just, not just running, not just strength, not just volume of training, but the amount of kicking uh, teams are actually doing. I imagine players will go back and do a hell of a lot of kicking in a lot of the early sessions. So if they haven't been doing that, again, that's going to be, you get guys getting silly nicks, quad strains, sore groins, um, so that was just something that uh, that kind of popped into my mind uh, over the last couple of days. No, that's great, Brian. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, anybody else there raised their hand? Let's see. Uh, Brendan Harper there. Brendan, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Brian, I uh, just want to check with you in terms of... Uh, Fitness testing, how to schedule that in. Uh, obviously, you don't want, but you know, if you put guys in a fitness test, they want to push themselves to prove something. So, well, what we would use to time this, uh, the fitness, particularly around, say, sprints and um, endurance sprints? Um, well, it, it, it depends on the, like, if the type of test you've done or an aerobic based fitness test. Um, generally, obviously, you need, you need to do your testing when the players are fresh. So, they need probably at least. 48 hours of, of no activity before coming into test. You make sure the players are all well rested before you test. Doing it at the very start of your session is also really important as well to give you give you an, an accurate uh, an accurate uh, an accurate score. Um, you know, and we would do a lot of aerobic based testing at the beginning of training. Give players maybe five to ten minutes of of, of the walk recovery, and then we you can still train after that. There's no reason you can't. It has to be a, a session on its own. In terms of doing a speed assessment like the, the, the principles would be the same it would be early in the session players fresh and um, i would just be you know just going back to my original point of the high risk activities like sprint testing or, or repeated sprint assessments and um, you know I, I, I would allow players kind of build build up to that kind of form of, of, of testing or, or training as something that probably wouldn't be you know, be reluctant to throw in in the, in the early weeks of their of the training so um I'd be putting that one on the long finger until they've built up a little bit of a base and a little bit more training under, under their belt, would be my advice. Okay, thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Um, Geraldine, you told me you wanted to ask Brian a question about, uh, about your training, so uh, now's your chance. <laughs> Is there any word on the on the minor under twenties? And Jerry's with the minors, yeah. I know, but has there been any? I know that the the senior in the county has been mentioned in terms of October. Is, it, is that going to be the same for the under twenties and minors? Or uh, J J Tom Tom Gray is here as well too. So I I don't think there's been any official notification just yet. Uh, so I'm I'm not sure if the lads really no. know. No confirmation there. There's been no confirmation on minor anyway that I am aware of. That's what I thought. Um, yeah, no, 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 official confirmation under twenty, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, so there's still a little bit of still a little bit of shooting in the dark in in in, in, in that regard. Just in relation to um, just in relation to the warm up, Brian. I know that um, uh, the GA would have would have uh, placed a, a huge emphasis on the Gaelic fifteen. Um, what what are your own thoughts in relation to that in terms of? Um, as a as a, a really sound warm up to get the to get people uh, engaged in all the the basic movements before getting into the main part of the training. Yeah, um, I mean, well, to give you give you an idea of what you know, what was the sound structured warm up would, would look like. Um, obviously, we I what I would do is variations of of the of, of the the GA warm up. Um, I don't necessarily stick rigidly to it, but. You know, the, I suppose the fundamental principles would, would be pretty similar. A lot of the time, it involves you know players doing their own little bit of work beforehand. I think I think something we've actually got very good at in the in the GA. So you know, foam rolling, self massage, you know, band work, 
you know, that stuff players do maybe in the dressing room or or on the side of the field now if if, if it's a if, if it's a nice evening. Um but gradually kind of kind of kind of progressing the warm up from you know low intensity straight line stuff, general mobility, um, you know, uh uh, you know, squats, lunges, leg swings, all the major muscle groups they're, they're going to be using, and then putting them into more, I suppose, game specific movements like Roger was, was touching on there. So, stopping, starting in a controlled environment, uh, a little bit of reactive stuff at, at the end, um, and maybe some high intensity running at the end. Um, that's the, the boxes I, I I try and tick as I as I go as I go through my warm ups. Uh, certainly, the first ten to fifteen minutes of it, in the last. You know, 10, 15 minutes of it might be obviously more game based stuff with the coaches. So, you know, a kick and exercise, a shooting exercise, a small side of game, something like that. Um, but, but again, I don't, it doesn't have to be the same warm up every time. I know there's a nice model there from the GAA. I think if you look at the principles of it, you know, you can, you know, you can tweak it to, to, to suit your group. Certainly in terms of variety as well, it's, it's really important. Yeah. And just, you, you talked about the RPE. Um, I suppose from a from a, a club perspective, it's probably a very easy enough task for a coach to do is just simply get players to rate the session on their own um, perceived uh, exertion level, and, and that gives you a good indicator of maybe where they are themselves in terms of their fitness. Yeah. Or their yeah no, absolutely. As I said, like um, like. I suppose you can go down to of taking everyone's everyone's RP if if you've never done it before and you're only looking to introduce it. Even taking a small sample is is better than than doing no one. So if you even take you know seven, eight, a dozen people, um, if if you've a squad of twenty five or whatever, um, generally that that will that will be representative of, of the group. Um, again, like even like if 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 I don't. Know, Training load is obviously a term that gets kind of used a lot, but quantifying your training load with RPE and time on feet is, is really simple. So you just multiply one by the other. So um, if if you train for 50 minutes and the average RPE is five, so that gives you 250 units per se if you're training load. And it's tracking that on a session to session basis or a week to week basis allows you to keep an eye on that that kind of acute versus chronic uh, training load ratio. Um, and there's been some you know, criticism of that um, in the literature recently um, as linked to, to injury, but even having an understanding of what you're doing to players, I mean, it, it, it is a monitoring tool and it is, it, it, it is better than, than nothing, in, in, in my opinion. Um, thanks, thanks for that, Brian. Just, uh, Condith Donnelly has a question, I think. Condith, do you want to come in? Sorry, missed you there. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, yeah. We can hear you, Condith, yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you, yep. Yeah. Brian, uh, Brian uh, this is a, a question related to our club team. Uh, obviously, like probably most of the guys here involved with our club team over the last three months of, with limited resources, been trying to implement some type of management of how the boys train and what to send back to us, you know, videos, Rava groups, all that type of stuff, and GPS and stuff. Uh, when they do come back and you obviously stayed at the point that you know, re retesting them would be be vital, but uh, I suppose the question I'm asking is uh, how gradual, and we have quite a short know what's well, I think what Roger's alluding to. How gradual do you think we can move the preseason on compared to normal, assuming that the boys have done what you've asked them and that the, the time has been off? Yeah, well, it's, it's it depends on the it really depends on the individual. I mean, if you if you've got guys that have been you know, looking after themselves over the last while in terms of their their their, their running fitness and they test well. I mean, I, I my advice would be, well, why not tackle tackle some that try, try and get some strength development into those players again, just to just to uh, mitigate their 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 risk of injury. Um, but for guys that are that are, are running, you know, poorly or struggling or, or off the pace, they may just need to even you know. We kept out of, of maybe the, the game based stuff and just just concentrate on, on getting the, the running fitness back back up to speed. In, in in terms of a window, I mean, you know, I know coaches, uh, particularly in JR, are always very uncomfortable with, with doing nothing. But I've always said, you know, if I if I get four to six weeks with a squad before we go into competition, I'd be I'd be very happy, and that's even starting from from from, from a low base. Um, I, I to be honest, I, I'd be critical of the amount of time we spend preparing our teams in, in game football. I don't think it takes as long as 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 we often take as coaches. You I mean two three month 
pre-season teams are doing. It's just it's, it's nonsensical, you know what I mean? So if, if you you know if you can't get a team up to speed if, after four to six weeks, I'd be I'd, I'd be worried. We made a decision this week constantly of sorry, it's just, well, part two of Annabelle's. Uh, whereas the GF changed the advice that you can go back from, I think it's just Wednesday on in the, the small group training. We've strategically taken the decision not to go back this week to allow the boys to, they're in, they're in small running groups of six. And I've seen over the last fortnight or so that it's been really effective so because we've put an older player in that group who's leading the boys on. It's been really effective. They're sending us photos in of everybody doing the running and we know it's been done because of the leadership groups. So we've made a conscious decision not to jump straight back and to let that bed for a while and then it means they will be fit to train essentially. Is that yeah. the right yeah, thing no, to do? I, again, I'm, look, we're preaching to the, to the converted here. Huge fan of recovery weeks and giving guys uh, time down, particularly in, in, in between phases. Um, so they come back obviously. They come back obviously fresh. They come back. They they, they come back. They they come back eager. And I think over the duration of a season, it, it really stands to them. Um, so I always look when I'm when I'm when I'm managing a group or planning out the year. Okay, where am I going to put it down? With where can I give them a break? Because uh, I think it really maximizes. Uh, I guess anecdotal and just in my experience, it, it just really maximizes the training adaptation. It keeps the players fresher in in the, in, in the long run. And um, the best kind of response I've got from players in terms of how you feel and, and you know the most positive responses I've got have been after two, three, four days off training. They come back onto the pitch and how do you feel? Say, I feel unbelievable. I feel great. You know what I mean? And that flies in the face of what we often do with players. We think, well, if we get more into them and you know they'll, they'll be they'll be confident in the work done. And I, I've, I've actually I've never seen a player after putting in you know session after session after session turn out and say I feel unbelievable I feel great invariably it, it, it takes its toll on them and it's, it's tough I mean I'm not saying we shouldn't train hard I'm saying we should do what you're doing take the opportunity after we've trained hard after we put the work in to you know take the foot off the gas for three or four days and just revitalize the player revitalize the group as you know it certainly stands to them in the in the, in the long run. Yeah, you're muted there. Owen Devine has a question for you, Brian. Owen, do you want to come in there? Hello, Brian. Thanks very much for that, Brian. Very informative. Um, my question is just in relation to recovery. People who are involved, for example, in athletics would say that GA teams don't do enough running after a session, part of their, in their cool down, like I know myself, generally it's run the top, pitch and back and then stretch. Um, firstly, is there something that you would say that we should be doing there? And then secondly, just with the idea of baths, some people believe in hot baths, some people believe in cold baths, the both. Mm. Um, and finally, would you recommend nine hours sleep, eight hours sleep, seven hours sleep after a session? And if you don't get that, and you're heading to another session, maybe you're on the age team that night, having trained with your senior day before, are you obviously going to be at risk? Because there's a certain point you'd say, no, you got opt out here, you've only had a certain amount of sleep. Sorry for firing a few questions at you, Brent. Yeah, no, you're fine. Well, I'll, I'll, like, I'll tackle the whole recovery process and what, what, what I encourage players to do. Um, so we, we start immediately, immediately post-training. Um, we, we obviously train even time, you know, senior to county, there can be a lot of meetings, they can drag on. Um, I always try and get the players fed at home as 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 quick as I can because we like to we like to we like to target sleep. We like to get them into their beds and we like to start the recovery process. So um we don't spend a huge amount of time. We would do a, a very low intensity, you know, jog at the end of training and, and a static stretch. Um it, it, it wouldn't be too extensive, to be honest with you. Um, the priority is refueling and, and, and getting home and getting to bed. That, that they're the two things I, I, I really go after because of the, you know, sleep and nutrition, as far as I'm aware, are the only two really proven strategies to, to, to enhance recovery. A lot of the things you're talking about there, like the compression garments, the ice baths, um, the you know, contrast bathing, my my kind of advice around them. We, we generally keep generally encourage people to keep away from the ice baths during preparatory periods when we're doing say strength training because it can actually actually blunt the training adaptation a little bit. So um, 
I would encourage players to, to maybe use them when they need them. So if you're going through a really hectic block of fixtures and you, you, there actually there is a need to recover quickly, then by all means go after it then, but less so, uh, uh, less so during, a, during a preparatory period. But when any of them, they have a little bit of a, you know, they can have a placebo effect. And, you know, I've used the motto before, like, if it works for you, it works. And I, I never stop players doing it, you know what I mean? Because often if, if they feel positive about it and they feel fresher, even if on a physiological level it's had, you know, little or no impact, they think it has, then, you know, that's better for that player. So I never kind of stop anyone doing something if, if they feel strongly about it. But the things we really push are, are, are eating well and, and, and sleeping. Um, in terms of you know hours of sleep, you know, I think I think eight hours is the is 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 the is, is seems to be the magic number. Um, simple tips, um, I've, I've seen which I thought are really good. I think I saw Gary Matthews here. I think he's on the players. Um, he said, if you can get to bed an hour earlier over the course of, of the course of a week, it's an extra night's sleep. So small things like that, we kind of like to like to uh, stress the players. Um, I remember doing a talk with some of our development squads, um, showing that uh, there was age group players with you know I think it was less than eight or as little as six hours sleep, or an increased risk of, of colds and influenzas, um, things like that. So we, I remember I remember pitching it to them in terms of availability. So they're all you know in a highly competitive environment. They want to represent the, the county minor, and I was speaking to them about putting their best foot forward. And I says, if you're not looking after yourself, you're not recovering well, if you're not sleeping well, you're going to pick up colds and flus, you're going to miss training, you're not going to be available, kind of selling it to them from, from that point of view. So, um, I don't know if that answers. Is there anything else that I miss on anything? There? No, 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 that's that's perfect. Um, and you're right with the. Uh Superstitious lads, if they like dice, they like yeah, dice. It's, and, 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 and like, there's a, there's a lot of yeah, I, I, gimmicks is a, is a bit harsh, but there's a, there's a lot of recovery products out there. And there's, you know, we live in a world of social media where, you know, all it takes is, is, a, is, a, is a pro player in the States to pick up something and say, yeah, this is great. Like, of course he is. He's, he's been paid to say that. Like, you know, and then every GA player thinks they need to have it. You know, so again, try not to be, try not to deviate, deviate too much from the cornerstones of your recovery. So sleeping and, and eating well. If you do those two, two things well, you know, you're, you're certainly not going to go too far wrong. Thank you, Brian. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Owen. Uh, we might just take uh, uh, two more if there's uh, two more questions there from anybody. Um, uh, we're just gone over 45 minutes now at this stage, nearly 50 minutes. So we'll just maybe take two more final questions, please, if there's anybody out there. So, uh, Roger, I think, uh, do you want to come in there again? Well, listen, just listen to the other guys, Brian. I'm just thinking the the competition now in Tyrone is starting on the 31st of uh, July. Mm -hmm. So we have like, the, so that's a Friday night. Uh, the match, there's another match on a Sunday, so there's like two matches, two weekends in succession. So we're looking at four games in 10 days. Um, it's a fairly cluttered, it's a small window, fairly cluttered competition, up to eight to 12, 15 games potentially in that. So recovery is going to be crucial during that period. And I'm just thinking, you know, there's going to be likelihood of injuries anyway, but that's potentially going to add to it. So recovery is going to be key. So if you have any pointers at all and why... Obviously, the Tuesday night sessions will just be recovery sessions for those first two weeks anyway, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, like, I had a chat with Jerry about this in terms of, you know, putting out what's best practice and that. And, you know, it, it, it may fly in the face of, of fixture committees and, and, you know, they may put out, like, what you're alluding to now, they may put out fixtures that makes it very difficult for coaches to follow what, what would be best practice. And look, I, 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 I totally get that. Um, you're right, you know, in terms of, you know, physical development, you're not, you're not going to be chasing any sorts of physical development during that period. It's all about just getting the players uh, recovered from game to game, trying to get the most out of the game. Um, uh, if, if you have the luxury of a, of a big... Obviously, that's gonna that's gonna come into play. Um, using your substitutions well, keeping an eye something simple as just keeping an eye on, on, on game minutes. Um, so you know, monitoring how many minutes a player plays every every game, and you know, if you're going into that fourth game, it ultimately depends on the on the importance of the game. 
look, if 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 you need your best team out, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter many, many minutes they played before that. If it's a game you absolutely have to win, you're gonna put your best team out. And look, I understand that kind of flies in the face of of of, of some of the points I've made, but that's 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 a real world setting. Um, but if you have the luxury of of a, of a of a bigger squad, a stronger squad, and you can you know monitor minutes, uh, monitor minutes, and, and kind of manage players across a hectic player like that, that's that's probably all you can do in, ter- in terms of training. Um, you know, do you even need to? Certainly between those games, or two day was it Friday and Sunday, wasn't it? Friday? Yeah. So you have, you have a Tuesday night training, which to me is probably be, will be a recovery session. Yeah, yeah, like playing on Friday night and then playing on Sunday morning again. Yeah, for the first two weeks. So you have four games in ten days. Now I'm thinking possibly of having them. Maybe some of these guys have used bands. Some of them are very good using foam rollers. But I was thinking of doing a collective session, just how to do little things like that. Maybe for the older players who. Might not be that familiar with foam rolling and that, just get them doing a wee bit and that sort of stuff. Even. I do, but like on a Tuesday night, after playing Friday, Sunday, Tuesday night, even doing a bit of yoga on, on the pitch or something. Um, Perfect, yeah. Anything yeah. like that. Um, you know, you, you, could probably, you could probably take the week away from you and then you probably take the week off training. Do yeah. the yoga on a Tuesday, do some walkthroughs maybe the following Thursday night and then yeah. play again on, on the Friday. Like, I mean, that's as, as yeah. much as, 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 as I, I would advise. Generally, you know, and I, I've, I've practiced this as well. I remember in between, in between drawing all, all Ireland finals, we did very little, very little. The, the, the approach we took was, we're not going to get any fitter in yeah. the next two weeks, no matter how often we train. We're going to have what we have in two weeks' time. So let's just, come, let's just give the lads a bit of a break this week. Let them recover. We'll probably have one yeah. moderate session in between the two games, and, that, and that's going to be it. And, okay. um, I, I, I generally think that's what kind of has, 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 has stood to us in previous years is our willingness to take our foot off the gas and say, and kind of yeah. back what we've done to date, not always be looking for more, more, more out of, the, out of the players physically. Okay, just get the heads right. Mm. No, Brian, that's great. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. I'm going to leave the last one for your uh, your teammate back in the back in the days. Stephen O'Shaughnessy there has a has a question for you. Shaco, you want to come in there? He's heard enough. <laughs> He's hiding. He's heard enough. He doesn't listen to me in the office most days. So. Sorry, Ger. Uh, Sorry, Stephen. Yeah. Sorry, Brian. Uh, first of all, Brian, good to see you. Um, yeah. You've obviously had a, a haircut over the lockdown. Uh, you're normally a lot hairier than that. Um, no, no. No comment. <laughs> um, I suppose one thing that kind of comes up, Brian, a lot, and, and I'm just going to, obviously, we've the lads have kind of asked a lot of questions about maybe senior adult club level, but it was the majority of guys here are, are, are overseeing development squads and, and, and youth players. And you, I suppose in, within your role now in, in Dublin the last couple of years, and, and even, I suppose, thinking back to your time within the Leinster Academy, is there any kind of advice? Because uh, we got a lot of obviously players asking us, how can I get bigger? How can I get stronger? These guys are 15, 16, 17 years of age, and, and they're a little bit worried. But I'm kind of I'm looking for you maybe to tap into that side of things and just maybe what you learned in Leinster, the maybe the do's and don'ts kind of um, with those age groups because obviously they're fragile age groups and not everybody has the luxury of a high performance manager um, with, with a group. And stuff like that. <laughs> so, uh, but it is I suppose something that coaches are always asked by players when they're out there. Um, but but just maybe you know your experience on that that element, and particularly with the younger players. Yeah, um, the whole big, the whole bigger, the big, the bigger, stronger concept. Um, you know, it, being of a of a certain size and a certain strength level is, is obviously relative to the to, to the sport. Um, there is no set size or weight to, to, to play Gaelic football, in, in my opinion. You know, it's very dependent on, 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 your, on your position and it's, 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 it's relevant to your, to your peers. Obviously, if you want to play midfield for Dublin, you know, chances are you're going to need to be six foot plus and um, 85 to 88 kilos. Like, that's just the, the physique of, of, the, of these guys. But, if, you know, we have guys at the lower end of that with 5'11", 75 kilos. That. So, um, being being big is not necessarily a prerequisite for being a, a Gaelic footballer. That's, that, 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 that's, the, that's the first point I would make. Um, 
I think it's really important to communicate that to, to, to young players, you know, what, what, what differentiates players, in my opinion, is obviously their, their footballing ability. Um, and why is the phys- they, might, they may be more stretched in terms of the physical attributes at a younger age. That gap, even without any training, will reduce naturally o- o- over time. And it's, you know, you know, the more talented football players or, you know, the more skillful players may generally come to the fore, albeit a, a, a little bit later. Um, in terms of having said that, you know, even through the work we do around development skills, there is no, no issue with exposing players. And I encourage where possible to expose players to, to, to strength training from a young age, even from, you know, you know, learning fundamental exercises like learning how to squat, you know, learning how to lunge, you know, learning upper body activities. So, you know, when they're of age, you know, when they're coming under 15 or 16s and working on developing strength, that they have the kind of prerequisites to be able to do so. You know, basics like low level plyometric training, the whole area of jumping and landing is really important from obviously power out, but even injury prevention, the mental jumping and landing players do on, on the pitch as well. Um, so I don't know, like I'm, I'm, I'm probably going around in circles here a little bit. Is there anything else you want to steer me on? Um, no, not, not, not really. I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of touching base just with the play, like with, with the mentors that we have involved and the messages maybe that we, we should be sending those guys. And even like, uh, one thing that maybe crossed my mind is just biomapping players and things like that. I mean, just, you know, you know, guys, and I suppose we've seen kind of studies on the guys who were born in the first half of the year. Yeah, like there is a thing about whole relative age effect, and 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 guys, of course, you can have a difference of of twelve months between guys, and and that can have a big impact. Generally, you know, early maturers as well. So if they're older and early maturers, they can be physically bigger, they can have higher muscle mass. Generally, they're going to be they're going to be fitter and they're going to be faster and, and they're going to be stronger. And that, from a selection point of view, is is, is really important. So. What um, what what some organisations do is yeah they, they look they look at bio banding so so grouping players according to, to maturity instead of instead of instead of chronolog- chronological age so you could look at you know grouping from your own, from what you're really going kind of pre puberty your twelve to fourteen year olds you're probably going a bit lower than where we're kind of catering for yes we may have kind of late developers kind of kind of in that kind of post post uh, puberty um but grouping players of a similar um of a similar level of biological development and looking at them then you're purely looking at their footballing ability where the physical advantages they might have uh, through age are kind of taken away um so yeah like it, it is it is it, it is an area it is an area of interest yeah um yeah i think it's one that Potentially, GA yeah, may, may, may should Thanks very much, that. Stephen, for that. Uh, for that. Um, and that a really, really interesting question. Um, I don't think we have any more takers, Brian, but uh, I, I would just like to say thank you very much for uh, giving up your time this evening. I know that you're going to be very busy getting back to training and uh, also getting back to playing yourself because I know you're still very active as a player. And uh, delighted yeah, to have you. Very active. What? I wouldn't say very active. Well, <laughs> you'll be back. <laughs> You'll be, pl- you'll be back starring for, oh, for Scaries, I'm sure. More of a holding role, Jerry. Corner forward role, yeah, or full forward role. Um, but look, it's great to have your, uh, your, your, your applied wisdom uh, because it's, it's so, mo- so important for us as coaches that we're taking away practical tips. And I'm delighted that, that that's the sort of information that you were, you were, you were giving us this evening. And uh, great that you were able to share your time and ask, yeah. uh, answer so many questions of the coaches here. Yeah. So, listen, Brian, thank you very much. We'll just, we'll just, um, say, we'll, we'll just finish on. Soon. We we'll just finish on, on, on one thing again. T- thanks, thanks for having me on. Mm. Um, so, uh, if all I wanted to, like coaches to really take from this, I know I gave some just really simple practical information. A lot of it is, is from you know, my own experience as a coach. But just even taking the time to, to obviously think about your training, map it out, plan it accordingly, it goes a long way to solving a lot of these issues. A lot of these issues I have raised. So. Um, getting away from the habit of you know what has that team done or what has that team done and, and just replicating it you know it's, it's never a good idea um, so just putting a little bit of more thoughts of what your training look like what's it going to look like in terms of uh, intensity in terms of running efforts you know is it is it going to be a volume based session is it going to be repeated sprints you know uh, get, 
how you have an understanding of what you're asking your players to do before they do it allows you to manage that group uh, a, a little bit better. Okay, so that just again challenging coaches to to, to to think a little bit about more in terms of planning and designing their, their, their training programs. That's, that's great, Brian. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I might ask the guys to stay on for a minute just to think, Brendan. Will